Welcome back. This is lecture seven about T cells. I've previously talked about the innate immune response, how it's the first immune response initiated against invasion by a pathogen. It occurs within hours and it's our first line of defense. And I talked about components of the adaptive immune response, which are B and T cells. I've spent about two lectures talking about B cells and what they produce, which are antibodies, and how they're critically important to clear infections. And today's lecture is on T cells. So T cells are named because they mature in an organ known as the thymus. There are two main types of T cells, helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Both helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells see portions of a pathogen presented on special molecules called MHC molecules. Helper T cells see small polypeptides presented on MHC class 2, and cytotoxic T cells see portions of a pathogen presented on MHC class 1. I'm not going to go into the differences between MHC class 1 and class 2, but they are very important differences. Uh, and the presentation of these molecules help get a T cell activated or recognized. So the T cell has a T cell receptor on its surface and portions of the T cell receptor are very unique to each pathogen that it sees or each portion of a pathogen that it sees. So we have millions of T cells in our body and each T cell has the same T cell receptor on its surface and each T cell receptor will see a very small portion of a pathogen. So we have millions of T cells specific to pathogens that we've been exposed to. So influenza, in this case, sars coronavirus 2 every pathogen that we have uh, been exposed to will be presented in portions depending on the MHC class 1 molecule that you have. And if you have a naive T cell that can see it, the naive T cell will then get activated. So what do these T cells actually do? So a helper T cell has many functions. As I mentioned before, it has a T cell receptor on it and it can, it's the most important T cell subset. So how does it really help? So it helps by secreting a class of molecules called cytokines. These are soluble molecules and there's many soluble molecules that are secreted by helper T cells. And helper T cells can then help activate B cells to secrete more antibodies. They can also activate antigen-presenting cells, and the antigen-presenting cells could be a macrophage or a dendritic cells, and they can help activate these cells to destroy pathogens. Helper T cells can also help activate cytotoxic T cells, which, are help, which un, can kill an infected cell. So what is the other type of T cell? It's a cytotoxic T cell. These T cells are an important part of the immune defense. These T cells can attack and kill infected or infiltrated cells. So typically they can kill a virally infected cell. So in this case, if you have a dendritic cell that's been infected with SARS coronavirus and portions of SARS coronavirus are being presented on MHC class 1 molecules to the T cell, a cytotoxic T cell can get activated. It can release cytokines, but more importantly, it can release cytotoxic granules known as granzymes, and these cytotoxic granules can be released and generate pores or create pores in the antigen presenting cell and actually kill a virally infected cell. So it's not only a virally infected cell that a cytotoxic T cell can kill. It can kill any cell that's abnormal in some way. So even a cancerous cell that's now presenting antigens that are not normal or different from what a healthy human could be, a cytotoxic T cell can actually then kill a cancerous cell as well. So anything that's abnormal or atypical can, if it's recognized by a cytotoxic T cell, the cytotoxic T cell can mediate killing through the release of cytotoxic granules called granzymes, but they can also use another mechanism, and I'm not going to get into that, but there's another mechanism of, of the interaction of a receptor and a receptor ligand called FAS and FAS ligand. And cytotoxic T cell can use this mechanism to also kill an infected or abnormal cell. If you want to learn a little bit more about T cells, please take a look at Khan Academy. They have a very nice descriptive um, descriptions of both helper and cytotoxic T cells.
What happens when you are exposed to a pathogen for the first time? So shown here is antigen that you are exposed to for the first time. You have pre-existing naive T-cells. So these naive T-cells have unique T-cell receptors against all kinds of pathogens. We have millions of combinations of naive T-cells. And the variable portion of the T-cell receptor will recognize a very select uh, peptide or polypeptide that's presented on these MHC molecules to naive T cells. So naive T cells, when they recognize a small polypeptide or, or antigen, can proliferate. So proliferate means multiplying. So you have you go from one naive T cell to 100 in a matter of days. And with proliferation and the secretion of cytokines, they can also get activated and become an effector T cell. So an effector T cell can produce either cytokines or they can also produce cytotoxic granules as we just discussed. And these effector T cells are quite useful in helping other components of the immune system or also eliminating virally infected cells. But since they're spewing out a lot of cytokines and cytotoxic granules, you don't want this to happen for a very long period of time because that could be detrimental to the rest of the healthy cells in your body. And some of the effects that people are seeing might be because the effect to T cell response is lasting too long in infected people. And it's the cytokine response that might be damaging uh, your lung cells, which is why some healthy people are getting critically ill. We don't know that yet, but that's what one speculation is. So following uh, an active effector T cell response, most of the T cells die out, and then a subset of cells become memory T cells. So memory T cells are a type of antigen-specific T cell that's now seen a pathogen. So in our case, we have memory in people who've been exposed, whether they've had either asymptomatic or symptomatic infection, you will now, in a matter of weeks, will have a subset of memory T cells specific to that pathogen. So we will have memory T cells do a lot of portions of SARS coronavirus too. And these memory T cells are long lasting, so they can last in your body for years after infection has resolved. And the advantage of this is if you are exposed to that same antigen, say six months, one year or two years from now, these memory T cells can quickly get reactivated upon exposure. So the thinking is if you have an exposure in the fall or two years from now, if you have a very significant number of memory T cells with the right effector functions, these memory T cells can get activated rapidly and now eliminate the pathogen for the second time. And, and every vaccine hopes to develop this. So you hope to have a vaccine that can induce a very strong response in memory, and when you get exposed to a natural pathogen, then hopefully the memory T cells can get reactivated quickly and eliminate the pathogen as soon as you're exposed for the second time. So this is very different when you see this antigen or the pathogen for a second time compared to when you see it for the first time. So I want, would like to just mention there's another group of T cells called regulatory T cells. I didn't talk about this, but these regulatory T cells are crucial for the upkeep of tolerance or also to make sure that the immune response is not excessive and going out of control. As I mentioned, if you don't die out at this stage, these effector T cells can cause damage as well. So it's constantly the battle between the viral infection and the immune response. So the immune response is doing something, but it can also do too much of a good thing. And you don't want that to happen. So regulatory T cells are very critical to shut down T cell mediated immunity towards the end of an immune response. And also in the case of autoimmunity to suppress autoreactive T cells. So how does COVID-19 affect your body. Most people who are exposed have mild infections, and these infections resemble the flu. So dry cough, low-grade fever, because this is a respiratory infection, you inject, you ingest particles and it replicates in the lung and you have a mild infection. As I mentioned, though, you have an immune response that's immediately generated against the pathogen. And the inflammation in some cases can also be a bad thing. In many cases, it's a good thing because it can control the infection. But if you have too much inflammation, it can cause fluid to accumulate in the lungs as the immune system fights the viral infection. 
It's not really clear as of yet, but it's uh, possible that an outsized or oversized immune response to the viral infection is a major cause of the sepsis. And that's a reason why some healthy people are becoming very sick. They're generating an immune response in the lung, but that immune response is too much. And the side effects of too much in terms of cytokines produced or cytotoxic granules that are killing infected cells is the price to pay. And that price to pay could be sepsis or dangerous drop in blood pressure leading to septic shock. We don't know that yet, but in a few months, it's going to be evident from a lot of um, research studies that are going on why some people are getting critically ill. I'd like to end this lecture by talking about how complex the immune system is. So every component of the immune system, so uh, T cells that are both CD4 and CD8 T cells, which are part of the adaptive immune response, interact with every other component. So there's a lot of interaction going on between different cell types in the body. This is taken from a review that I wrote with other colleagues uh, describing our efforts to elucidate the role of T cells in protection and pathogens of dengue virus infections. And I did this for my PhD as well. I spent six years trying to identify dengue specific T cells that recognize portions of the dengue virus uh, or polypeptides that are presented, that were presented on MHC class one molecules um, that were recognized by CD8 T cells. So it takes a lot of effort and time to be able to identify these T cells and characterize them based on their effective function. Do they help? Do they kill? How effectively are they able to do it? And how effective is long-term memory? So it's a complicated uh, immune system that we have to deal with. And in most cases, it helps clear an infection. In some cases, it's not adequate or it's impaired. And therefore, you may not have a strong enough immune response. So I would like to end by saying, if you have any questions about T cells, please take a look. There are a lot of lectures, again, online that would be useful to you. But having a strong B cell and T cell response is key for us to develop long-term memory and hopefully be able to control um, a re-exposure to this pathogen and effectively clear it. Thanks again. This is Anuja Matthew and this lecture is on T-cell immune responses.